So welcome to the latest in our Lancaster University Management School interview series. These are our masterclasses in collaboration with NatWest. And as we're all still in this COVID-19 situation, we can't gather. And so we're doing our masterclasses as online interviews instead. And today we are absolutely delighted to be joined by Rita Clifton. Um, so Rita started her advertising career where she, and then became vice chairman and strategy director at Saatchi and Saatchi during its most successful and iconic period. She then joined Interbrand, which is where, where we first got in touch. And Interbrand are the leading global brand consultancy. She was the London CEO and then became chairman for a 10 year term. You know, you will have seen Rita on many major TV, news and social channels. Her writings included the best-selling book around called The Future of Brands and The Economist book Brands and Branding. And her new book, which is absolutely fantastic, called Love Your Own Poster, was published by Kogan Page in the summer of 2020. And in 2014, in the New Year's Honours list, she was awarded a CBE for services to the creative industry. So we're very lucky to have you with us today, Rita. Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks very much for having me. And also, thank you very much for that introduction. So looking forward to this. Yeah. And I think the, the first question for me kind of around leadership is, you know, as you were coming coming into the industry, as you were kind of coming in and interacting with leaders before you descended that journey yourself, you know, what was your first experience of leaders and what did you kind of take from that, the good and the bad? Mm. Well, you know, I was thinking about this when did the leadership thing come from and you know my early experiences and actually weirdly before I even got into a proper job or the industry of course I had lots of experiences of leadership or lack of it and Jane, one of the things that really stuck in my mind and this is going to sound a bit weird is that actually you know my dance teacher at an early age when I think back she was an amazing leader like energizing you know, making everyone feel as though they could be brilliant, inspiring them and so on. And so I think sometimes we can take for granted some of these very early formative experiences and people who are role models for us. Um, I mean, fast forward much later, and of course I joined, when I joined Saatchi and Saatchi, a couple of things. Number one is I was then doing a job that I thought I was good at. I've been doing a job before that that I didn't think I was so great at. As, and so therefore I found you know, leadership of a role that I wasn't very good at, not surprisingly, was a bit tough. However, when I got to Saatchi's, I had become a strategist and as a practice leader, I could really do that role. And then running the whole department, you know, what I realized is what a huge impact you can make on people. And we did some extraordinary things. You know, we recruited people from unlikely places because we knew that they had very distinctive talents. And that was the great thing about Saatchi and Saatchi at that time. It was an extraordinary school for talent. And what's more, that talent was organized under a really powerful vision. I know that vision about nothing is impossible. And there was global ambition and everyone's performance and expectation was raised, which was a brilliant, brilliant example uh, of leadership. And of course, that's how I sort of absorbed the atmosphere. I wanted to help people become brilliant and you recruited people because you could see potential. And that I found was the most rewarding aspect, frankly, of being in work, being an executive and working in this kind of industry. So I did see and experience some really uh, great leadership. And then of course I became chief executive myself. And I learned a lot of lessons from the place was they believed in winning and they were passionate about winning good stuff. But they also thought part of winning was actually almost enjoying seeing other people lose not great that didn't feel natural yeah. to me so that was the part that I sort of cut out of my own experience so anyway powerful images powerful role models uh, and also some powerful learning I think what you said before about inhabiting the space that CEOs you know live in if you like I think that's really powerful because I know in my own business journey you know the minute that you start to get some success and start to get to that kind of top table as it were you you do almost feel this sensation of needing to be the caricature of what you expect a CEO to be. And it's really hard to break that actually and find your own style. You know, how did you approach that? Because obviously you were in a, in a very high profile business as well in a very, very competitive industry. You know, how were you able to kind of break out of the mold of being, 
you know, this, this pseudo CEO that everybody thinks we should be to becoming, you know, your own leader with your own style and method? Yes. Well, it's a really interesting question because, of course, as a strategy director, I really felt able to be myself because actually a big part of it was helping not only people within my team become brilliant, mm -hmm. but also actually helping my clients all you know, become brilliant through their strategic thinking, innovation and so on. Now, when I became chief executive, what I suddenly thought was, oh, my goodness, you know, now I've got to be the decision maker. You know, I'm at the top of the apex here. People are going to be expecting me to make you know, difficult decisions and tough decisions and so on. And there are certain expectations that these people have got about me. And I, it's not just the strategy. I need to worry about the vision thing and the toilets and, you know, people's appraisals and, you know, management systems, all of those things. And those are critical, of course, to being a CEO. So, of course, I had photographs taken of myself, you know, with the arms crossed, looking over the shoulder, you know, rather as yeah. one thinks. And I was wearing sort of stiff suits and, uh, and whatever and you know talking tough with my american owners and you know getting people down to look at the numbers because when you're a strategist you can afford to be a bit lofty you know in the long term you know we need to invest and blah 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 as the ceo you've got to look after the short term of course and short term results as well as having your eye on the longer term and keeping those two things in your mind at the same time by the way in my view is the essence of a really good ceo but what I did discover in trying to kind of act this sort of concrete chewing, you know, I'm a kick-assing type of uh, CEO, what I, what I really um, discovered from that is that um, it didn't come naturally to me. I wasn't able to nurture people in a way that actually felt natural to my uh, management style. Becoming, becoming a CEO yeah. and, you know, creating your own leadership style. But I think one of the areas which a lot of people will face in their own businesses and in businesses that they come into is that sense of imposter syndrome. You know, once you are at the top table, once you're in that chair, there's that sensation of, am I really able to do this? You know, how did, is that something that you felt? Is that something that you had to get over? Is it something that you still get today? How can, you know, how can we turn that into a positive as well? Indeed. Well, you know, I have experienced imposter syndrome throughout most of my career. And what I discovered is that about 70% of people experience imposter syndrome at some point wow. in their lives. And that goes up to 90% in the creative industries. Now, if anyone who is listening into this does experience imposter syndrome, you're in very good company. Now you're talking about Tom Hanks, Michelle Obama, yeah. Emma Watson. I mean, Olivia Coleman, multi-award winning actress, when she goes on sets for the first time, she often says, I think I'm gonna get fired. And that actually spurs her on to yeah. stretch herself, to work harder, to rehearse harder and really, really think it through. So she's actually found it quite a, you know, a powerful uh, drive. And certainly I've found that uh, powerful drive yeah. in my life. And actually, do you know, I've gradually got to you know, appreciate this thing that sits on my shoulder saying, this time, this time is going to be the time that everything goes pear-shaped. Uh, or, you know, this time, that's a really, really big role or a really big ask. You should step aside for someone who really knows uh, what they're doing. But actually, what I found is that, you know, the drive to prove yourself, you know, the drive to be good at something, to stretch yourself, can actually be a really healthy and useful drive if you want to end up leading things and if you want yeah. to end up as influential as you can be. Because... What I really believe is that so many more people are capable of leadership than currently think they might really? be. They might not fit the stereotype of leaders or the central casting leader, but that's exactly what we need, both as a human race, frankly, at the moment, and also as a planet. We need decent human beings to be running organisations, behaving like the human beings there are, not like some corporate construct. And that was my real challenge I suppose and that was my real sort of aha moment when I was playing the role of being chief executive yeah. because I wanted to nurture people I wanted to help people be brilliant and yeah. actually after about six months of the sort of you know play acting and this is how I should be what I discovered is actually you know faking it longer term is going to make you either miserable or ill and I just began to feel miserable. I sort of fantasized, frankly, about resigning, I think, most days during, during that period. Until actually I had a revelation, which is, do you know, um, 
I need to be myself in this role because I'll never be as good at trying to be somebody else. And actually nurturing is one of the most powerful forces in nature. And I'm an unashamed nurturer when it comes to oh, wow. developing and leading people. And actually, you know, we managed to do the things that I believed in when I was CEO. 50-50 men and women on the executive team, personal bursary programs, you know, personal development programs um, and courses. And that's what I found really crucially important for me. And also what I discovered is that actually that was a pretty effective form of leadership and it created role models for other people. So I found that really, yeah. truly rewarding. And that's why I also say, ignore the vice, fake it till you make it. Maybe we can talk about that in just a moment. I don't like that advice. I mean, I mean, this is, it is interesting, isn't it? Because there's an element that people say, fake it till you make it as a sort of substitute for saying, you know, build your skill set. But I feel that also from reading your book, you know, one of the things that's been very clear is that, that you've always taken this very active role at honing your craft as a leader, you know, whether it's engaging with nonprofits or finding inspiration elsewhere. You know, how did you do that? How did you approach kind of making sure that you're constantly keeping that leadership skill set sharp and, you know, what, what is needed for today's world? Mm. Well, I mentioned the drive. I mean, the drive factor is really important. The drive factor to end up doing something and put, putting you, you in a position where you can actually make the changes that you believe in. That is a super important part uh, of the drive. But also, I think that, you know, spending a lot of my career in branding, I find brand thinking really quite useful in thinking about how you make the most of yourself. So bearing in mind you have a drive, the first thing to think about is about clarity and that's about clarity of yourself, who you are, what you're good at, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are actually that you need to keep on working on because we shouldn't just, uh, we shouldn't ignore that. And this thing about what drives you, I've met a lot of people who are in leadership positions and I'm sure we all have, mm. where you go, you have got really difficult personal stuff that you probably haven't, you know, got to grips with and as a result right. unless you bring this stuff up out to have a look at about what drives you and what might lie behind that you can visit that stuff not necessarily in a positive way with all the people who work around you and for you and you know they're treading on eggshells or they're wondering about whether or not you're a you know consistent authentic person so I think clarity of yourself is the fundamental place to start and also what your goals are I mean, we can all have short, medium and long term goals. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, from time to time in my career, when the children were small and I was working full time, a goal was stay awake for long enough <laughs> to kind of pay attention. Yeah. Um, but nevertheless, I then went through different goals. I, mean, I wanted to be an expert leader. That's why, you know, I did the books and I you know, wanted to develop my leadership practitioner skills. Um, and now, of course, you know, I've got a different and renewed purpose uh, that actually led to me writing the book, which is mm -hmm. I want business to be a much more human place to be and also to live in society, you know, behaving like the human beings we are and yeah. that connects with other people. Um, and also, of course, I want much more diverse uh, types of leader at the top of the organisation. So clarity, crucially important, then coherence about how your clarity of goals and purpose show up for everything you do and your skills. Absolutely, as you say, you've got to keep on honing and developing your skills, whether practitioner skills, if you want to end up running an organisation and being in the boardroom, you've got to understand the language of finance because the language of the boardroom is finance. Unless you speak that language, you're not going to be there. And also learning communication skills. I mean, when people say to me, oh, I hate presenting or, you know, I'm a bad public speaker and get very nervous. Well, frankly, when I first started doing public speaking, you know, if I had a piece of paper, it would be going <laughs> yeah. like that, yeah. you know, we've all been there. And I watched myself on video for the first time all those years ago and thought, oh, my God, that's so annoying. And my head's on one side or I'm looking upwards or looking sideways or flapping my hands. You know, you learn a lot. And Malcolm Gladwell's book that I'm sure a lot of people have read outliers, mm -hmm. um, whether or not this is an exact sum, but you know, 10,000 hours of practice is usually what it's needed to become an expert practitioner. That's yeah. quite a lot of presenting it and is. speeches. Yeah. Say yes is my, and then learn how to do it. And this thing, you know, the third characteristic of strong brands, including yourself is about leadership. That's about you leading and developing your own brand. And that means staying curious about what's happening. 
you know, staying curious about yourself. I've had coaching every few years that mm -hmm. I've been in leadership positions, but staying nosy about what's happening in the world outside and making sure that you are totally staying on top of what's happening. Because frankly, it's really interesting. Yeah. Human beings are interesting. What's happening in the digital world is interesting. And frankly, it's fundamentally important for us all yeah. to get on board with what we need to do to create a more sustainable world too. That's a whole other topic. Yeah. And I, and I know you, you, we talked a bit about brands there, but I think understanding personal brand as, as a leader is really important now because, you know, we are more visible as leaders. We're more visible externally as leaders. And it's important that we do think about what our brand therefore is. And I'd, I'd love to get some of your, you know, just some of the learnings that you've had about how you do that effectively. Because if we take even the most cursory swipe on social media, you know, we see lots of people who think that, building a social media brand as an entrepreneur means that you just tweet these business platitudes out all day and think that that's okay when it's not that at all. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I think um, whenever you mention the term personal branding, you know, you've got to put your tin hat on because no matter what you say around that, people still think you or you know you're being a social media influencer by you know using makeup or getting a hair done no, whatever that's not at all what I mean by personal branding I use personal brand thinking because I find it's a good discipline for really thinking about what it is you want who you are and how you can make the very most of yourself as yourself not some avatar the fake it type corporate construct but making the most of yourself as you are um, and so therefore, you know, to say that, you know, a person, to say that a brand is just the name and the advertising or the logo, or whatever, is a bit like saying human beings, a bit like just their face and their name and their clothes. Mm -hmm. It's always been the substance that lies beneath that has really made any strong brand work, whether it's an organizational brand or a personal brand. So I tend to look at branding as an organizing idea that's gonna generate sustainable value and influence. And that organizing idea, you need to apply to everything you do and say. And in other words, in an organization, it's no use pretending you're a smiley customer service organization on the outside, if you're an ax murdering culture on the inside, because it doesn't work <laughs> and particularly yeah. not in a digital age. And equally as a, as a person, as a human being, who you are on the inside of an organization or who you are on the inside, this stuff tends to get to the outside also. You know, there's no such thing as a private memo or a private yeah. email anymore or a private exchange as we know. So what I always say is use the brand as an organizing idea and a discipline for yourself, uh, you know, which is slightly different from just the, hey, be yourself and hang out because yeah, exactly. there are certain aspects I think that we all got about ourselves. So you think, Actually, I'm not sure if everyone needs to know that part of me, um, you know, yeah. or hanging out at home or wearing dressing gowns or watching daytime TV, these sort of things. What I talk about is being your best self, making the most of your of yourself. And there are certain yeah. skills and attributes that it's really, really healthy uh, to use. And of course, as part of your leadership, you want to find your clarity thinking and your leadership. You want to find the platform, your professional platform that lights you up. Mm -hmm. So mine has obviously been brands. Um, and you know, what I really believe is brands have got the power to change the world. And you know, they have done economically, they have done socially, they've crossed yeah. borders and connected people in a way that national governments have either not wanted to do or struggled to do. And now, of course, we need to use the power and the resources of those extraordinary, you know, powerful global brands to make the kind of environmental improvements yeah. and changes, regenerative type of changes. Uh, that we need. So I I have really, you know, got fired up by that kind of mission. And so I've written books on the subject. I've applied that thinking to many different uh, organizations, non-profit organizations, as well as, again, personal brand thinking. So think about what your platform, think about what your expert platform that lights you up and that you feel that you can bring, because then you need to start producing content that, you know, really takes that forward, you know, whether on social media or whether or not you do blogs or whether or not you're going to make commentary on um, the major uh, media channels, write books, any of those things. So um, find the thing that really does light you up. Yeah, wow. And uh, one sort of roundup question, if I may, Rita, which is obviously that the whole world's gone through this, you know, unbelievable time. And um, 
I didn't use the word unprecedented, which I'm quite proud of. Um, but you know, there's a lot of leadership Don't learnings. That, ah. <laughs> No, you're not. No, you're not. But those, those phrases you don't want to hear again, do we, ever? Yeah. No, but there's a lot of leadership learnings that have come from this in terms of transparency and communication and, and how you approach leading through a crisis and how you approach leading through uncertainty. You know, as a bit of a roundup for our audience, I'd love to just get some of your reflections on that, on what do you think we as leaders can learn from having, you know, lived through this time? Hmm. Well, I think that there are some sorry, practical uh, lessons um, and sort of literal business leadership lessons. And I also think there are some lessons that are all too human. So I think from a very practical point of view, you know, we've learned that we don't have to jump on a plane and go and have a meeting in Milan yeah. or, you know, whatever, stay there for a few hours and come back. Uh, there are ways of connecting and doing things much faster and much more efficiently. And clearly, there's no real substitute for being in a room with people, reading their body language, uh, you know, building relationships. Uh, there's a lot of pent up hugs, I suspect, out there, um, you know, uh, uh, for us all and with our fellow human beings. But I think from a practical point of view, we have learned some of those things. I think also from the kind of strategic and organizational point of view, we've learned that we can collaborate, make happen, make more things happen faster than we ever thought possible. I mean, you know, uh, lockdown happened and on one of my you know one of my boards and organizations we had to get thousands of laptops out to people really quickly and also in a secure state yeah. um, also the way that we've had to transition our business models from being either wholly physical to wholly online and end up somewhere in the middle I mean this has been extraordinary and by the way it's been helpful to use brand thinking for that because if you equate your brand just with a shop or a restaurant or whatever that's a really limiting category bound uh, mm. way to look at yourself and your business whereas if you think about this is what our brand stands for these are some of the customer relations we've got that can take you into all sorts of areas of development and also into a virtual world where you are serving customers but just in a very different way so i think we've learned to collaborate to move faster yeah. and also to think more broadly than we would ever have thought possible but I think on a very human level, you know, in doing the Zoom, in the Zoomitis that we've had over the last year, I think what's interesting yeah. is that, you know, people have had, uh, we've seen into people's homes, unruly pets and children have been sort of rushing in and out, tech has broken down. I think this has humanised us and our connection mm. with other people in a rather sort of strange way. Uh, you know, in a Zoom type world, a virtual world, I think in some ways we've become closer to some of the people that we've worked with because we've seen them and seen their broader lives and also just yeah. been more in touch with how it is that people manage to live their lives, particularly when you've had homeschooling and you know, lots of uh, things to sort out, uh, you know, in couples and between ourselves uh, and so on, and just to be more empathetic, for goodness sake, and also more understanding about people's lives and what it is that they're that, that they have to go through uh, yes. to get to your door. So I think in some way, and I hope this isn't just wishful thinking, is that it bodes well for us all when we get back in a room together and we try and understand everyone else's people and have the kind of empathy that we need to make organisations work and frankly, to make society uh, work better all round. Yes. So I think that's a pretty, important mission for us all just to think about and that of course is a big leadership challenge well no i i really do hope so rita and, and just you know thank you on behalf of everyone for your time today it's been a real honor speaking with you and you know thoroughly recommend your book to as many people as i can because it's such a good read thank and you, um, so you know much. we look forward to seeing you in person soon so thank you very much thank you and thank you very much for having me i really enjoyed talking to you so hope to see yeah. you in real life soon. yes thanks